This is Brad Montgomery. Welcome to the successful, interesting, and awesome podcast where I interview people who are, wait for it, successful, interesting, and awesome. <laughs> or at least one of the one of those three. What I love about this guest today is that he's really hard to categorize. The reason Mark Camacho is so successful, and by the way, when you hear the recording, I want you to keep in your mind, he's not bragging. He doesn't brag enough. He's just not that type of guy. He is more successful than you can tell from the recording. But the reason he is so successful is he found something he's passionate about. And then he just sort of comes from a place of service and thinks, well, how can I help? How can I make this? How can I make your day better? And then all along, he just provides a way above average and an excellent service. Well, he's a video expert. He's a media expert. He's a producer and a director. But I think the secret really for Mark, if we had to sum one thing up, the secret for Mark is that he just treats other people well and then the uh, the business follows and the money follows and you have a guy that's just amazing. The podcast is called Successful, Interesting and Awesome and Mark Camacho is all three. He's the hat trick. Let's do this. Everybody, it's Brad Montgomery. Oh, you're looking good. Well, this podcast is been kind of a surprise hit for me. <laughs> it, more successful than I thought it would be. Um, it's kind of like a COVID thing. Um, but also, it's just a really wonderful excuse to have people on that I really like and I really admire and I want to know more about. People with cool jobs who have done well for whatever reason, and then we get to ask them about their jobs and how come they're so awesome. And today is no different. This guy's been a friend for a long time, but also I was one of his clients because he did a lot of work for me in the video media production. I don't even know the right words. He's a fancy camera person. He just, he's like a producer kind of guy. Um, and he's our guest. Please say hello to my buddy, Mark Camacho. Mark. Hi everybody. I'm so happy to be here with Brad, my good buddy and my inspiration. Speaking of inspiration. <laughs> I'm putting your name on Camacho. Did I spell your name right, Mark? C A M A. Oh well, no wonder. <laughs> All right, so uh, here, when I first met you, I was new in the business, so trying to be a speaker, or uh, still a magician. I think I was an entertainer, and uh, you know, the thought was, well, you're supposed to have a video to promote yourself, and that was very overwhelming. And somehow, I got in your life, and you. <laughs> kind of metaphorically put your arm around me and said, Oh, Brad, I can help you come sit with me. And somehow you did. And it was awesome. And I've been following you for years and we've been friends for a long time. Thanks yeah. for joining me. Yeah, I'm happy to. You're my buddy. So what, what, what do you call yourself? What's your job title? Well, I do. I'm a media producer director. So involved in video media sound and picture and so i shoot i direct and i edit video media for business and um mostly speakers and authors and um content providers no way so is that still the majority of your work is people That's, in this bizarre speaking well, world actually i've had you name it i've shot it um i i fall into the category of the speaker world but I have produced work for corporate. I produce for medical science. Um, oh, high altitude adventure. I've done climbing shows. I've done out, uh, whitewater rafting shows. I have done, oh boy, I could go on and on. I've done um, a number of documentaries around the world. Um, I think it's 32 countries now I've been to. So a lot of, it's kind of educational and documentary based besides the speaker world. Right, so you're not shooting reality TV. You're not shooting I, Hollywood. Uh, I have not shot, real, well, I've shot some reality TV, but I have not really played that role where, you know, extensively. I've shot a few things that, well, for, an, for another discussion. Give us a little bit of the backstory. How in the world does a little boy grow up and suddenly he's a shooter and he's traveling around the world? You know, how'd that yeah. happen? Well, for me, I've always been visual. So I always used to play with the TV and I would turn the channel and turn the color controls. And I thought that was cool. I thought it was really neat that images could come through the sky and through 
transmission and show up on your box. And I thought that was cool. Anyway, I, um, I was in high school wrestling in high school, my college or my high school wrestling coach said, you need to pick a major because I'm sending you to college to wrestle. And at the time I was a janitor at Channel 9 News in Denver. And I used to uh, mop the studio floor before the 10 o'clock news. And he said, you need to pick a major. I said, well, I think this TV thing is pretty fun. Everybody's running around and shooting and producing video and making the news. I said, I'll do TV. And um, so I went to college to uh, Northern Colorado on a broadcast major. And then I actually got out of college and went right to work for PBS. And that led me into the motivational world and to the speaker world because I worked at the PBS station for about four years. And I started to learn, um, you know, the different methods of motivation, um, what we used to do on pledge drives. Um, people like Wayne Dyer and um, Gary Smalley and some of these old, um, Deepak Chopra, these were people that we used to show on our station. And I just kind of found my way into that world. That kills me that you were mopping the studio floor <laughs> and then you became, you became the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I so really you, liked the business. <laughs> you you and I have kids similar age. How old is your daughter? So Lauren is now 30. And um, my house was right down the street from yours, if you remember. I was on um, over there on the other side yeah. of um, whatever street that was. Yeah. And uh, she's now 30 years old doing culinary. Well, um, Chewy, yeah. the reason uh, when you started talking about that, I immediately went to my kids because you know, when you're in your twenties, it's hard to figure out how to find a career, how you're, how do you find it? You're into, into anything. And I've been sort of saying like, just take jobs and see what happens. And you're like the poster child for how that works. You're a janitor in a news show. Yes. You know, okay. So I really didn't have a direction. All I knew is I wanted to go to college and I wanted to wrestle and play football. I was too small for football, but I was really good in wrestling. And so after practice, I, I went to my job and I worked for the janitorial company and uh, they had the contract at Channel 9. So I'd go after wrestling practice and go mop the floor and mop the floor and clean the studio control room and do the trash. And they would these guys would run around playing Frisbee all the time before the news. They had a big studio set and there's all this open space. They'd play Frisbee. And I was a big Frisbee player. And I thought, where can I work in a cool environment and throw the Frisbee? I'm going to do this. And so I came to him the next day. I said, coach, I got it. I'm going to do TV. I'm going to be a TV production person. He said, great. And so he got me into UNC in Colorado, Northern Colorado. And I really liked it. You know, I started shooting stuff um, throughout my you know, four years. And I um, had an internship at um, a cable TV station. And I shot festivals and things. And people used to come up to me and say, this was in 1983. And they came up to me and said, you know, what are you doing? What are you shooting for? I said, I'm here for uh, United Cable at the time. And um, we're covering this event for public access. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, boy, you know, can you shoot this or can you shoot that? And I said, well, you know, this is not my gear, but maybe I can work something out. So I went and got a loan and got a big TV camera, big, big thing on my shoulder and a recorder that I'd put, you know, over my shoulder. And I walked around with this big news camera. I got a, a loan for this equipment got a light kit, a big news camera and a recorder. And I would start, I started shooting events and I, I went around and people paid me to cover events and make video. And um, this was in 1983. And then I just started shooting one event after another. And before I knew it, I had this business and, and then it just kind of worked its way into the speaker world. I am going to ask you how much that camera cost. Cause I bet you remember. But um, first, dude, I can't believe I'm saying this to the media guy. I'm getting a little fuzzy feedback on your mic sometimes. Oh, do you think um, that's you know, me? I'm, Could that be you? No, I'm pl I'm plugged into a speaker, so I have no sound coming out here other than my headphones. I'm all right. It could be just one of those gremlins I don't understand. This is why people like me need people like you. Right? You sound good to me. Well, I and I look good. I don't mind telling you. Yeah, that smile. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a weird trip. buzzing. I just heard it again. Could it be when your um, headphone oh, mic touches the, your uh, microphone? You know, it's possible. I'll move this here. I'll move it over. Oh, you know things of... that 
you're the right you're the guy I would ask for help on this. I might just do that. That might help. Um, all right. So years ago, you said, "All right, fine. I'm going into business. I need a fancy camera. How much did that thing cost?" At the time, it was a ten thousand dollar package, and it was a camera, a recorder, and a set of lights. And so I got this loan through the credit union, and um, I showed up in my beat up car, and I had this money. And the guy at the, it was one of these camera shops, you know, kind of in a professional camera shop. And uh, I had the money and I, he gave me the camera and he looked at me and I, he watched me go outside and I loaded this expensive gear to this <laughs> old crappy car in the trunk of this old crappy car. <laughs> and he just looked at me driveway. And that's, that's all I had to my name was that $10,000. Wow. So I had, I had a little apartment and I had a closet. And that closet was my production studio. It's where I left my gear, and that's where I hung my stuff. And and that was my studio, a little closet. Well, how scary was that for you? Because I think for a lot of people, going into debt for a crazy, a, you know, a piece of a gear would scare the crap out of them. I don't know. You know, they said, here's your, the credit union. You know, here's your monthly payment. Figure it out. And uh, so I thought, well, I can, you know, I shot a few events. Um, oh. Not long after that, I started working in um, like the entertainment arena and I started shooting shows. I shot um, performances like, like big dance shows, um, theatrical shows. Um, I shot pageants. I shot um, ice skating shows. I normally would see on cable access, but instead I went to these um, events and I said, I can produce this show for you and create these the, a really nice multiple camera shoot. And, um, and I sold videos and it became a real big, well, at the time it was big to me, I was 23. Um, I called it video engagements and it was a pretty busy and successful little enterprise. And I had, I had um, all these shows that I did. I had probably 32 shows throughout the year that I would shoot produce, put on big monitors, and as well, I would sell the videos to all the participants and all the attendees. And um, uh, we'd make several thousand dollars a weekend. I, it took me for a minute to get it, but like, give me an example of one of the events you were filming. Well, like we got involved with the dance community, and so uh. there were these big dance recitals, and these were schools that had like 500 students, big, big dance schools, and they'd have these big, big recitals so i'd come in and i'd put up uh screens uh, and i'd show the video footage on big screens on each side of the stage and then i would put a big monitor in the lobby and i'd have two camera people running and i'd sit as a director and i'd direct this show back in you know 1985 when my competition was camcorders on you know with right. so i had this big broadcast camera and so i could do these shows and i'd sell these tapes for 35 dollars and people would line up, just line up and, uh, and during intermission. And they were like, like I had to have two, sometimes three people at this table taking credit cards because people would, they'd stay and they'd watch the monitor and they'd see this beautiful performance because we would play back the first half of the show during their mission. And they would be like mesmerized because I would bring in these big high res. At the time, they were not HD because HD wasn't here. But we had these big high-res monitors and I would actually rent from the um, studio rental and they were, it was showing people this crisp image that they were, had never seen before because these were really expensive TV cameras on this big pr professional monitor and they would stop and be mesmerized. And the next thing they would do is pull out their credit card and they would buy these and buy these by the hundreds. We would sell a hundred to, well, we'd sell like 175 tapes per show. <laughs> and we would do like five, six shows a weekend. <laughs> and I had, you know, camera guys running around town and I had myself directing and other people directing. And um, it was a fun little business during my 20s and early 30s. I, I, I've been there. Like I've been there where there, all the other parents are lining up and your kid's looking at you like, Dad, you're not going to buy one? I was the first one to do that. There, there's other companies. I was the very first one in Denver. I had literally had at least 32 clients that, um, you know, schools and performing arts centers. And um, again, like I said, um, ice skating, we had a couple ice skating shows. Um, nobody was doing this until I, and then I had it all by myself for about, I don't know, over 10 years at least. 
And then every, you know, some, after a while, people would start showing up and trying to compete with me. But um, it was good for a long time. <laughs> but it still exists, right? So you invented that thing, but that's yeah, got to be out there. Yeah, they call it event video sales, event production. And people, you know, there are companies that that's all they do is they come and produce the show and sell videos. I kind of stopped doing it. I'm trying to picture you. So you were you were young and you had a lot of cash then, right? I had all, I I didn't really deposit my cash, and a lot of people paid cash. Now it's all credit card. Right. A lot of people would throw cash down, and so I would in my little glove box of my crappy car I have a <laughs> stack of cash like this. It would be twenty dollars bills, like that thick, and I just leave it in my glove box, you know, for whatever. And uh, I thought I was pretty cool. You're talking about your past, and you were telling me about um, kind of your amazing yeah. entrepreneur spirit as a young dude. But we need to get current, right? Because there's a lot of things going on in video now. Can you get us through a little bit about your career and how you got to, yeah. to where you are now? You run a big business. So um, so I told you about how I kind of started in what I called event sales, and I would produce videos and sell videos. and people would buy them. And then I got um, more involved in documentary work. And so um, really the big sort of change in my career happened in 1988 when I went on a five month tour with William Shatner and um, myself and three <laughs> other tech people. So there was a crew of like seven of us. So um, it was a core of myself and two other tech people that were the production team. And then Shatner was our host. and um, it's a show called, um, it's on, it's still on, it's uh, on WTBS, the superstation it used to be called. Anyway, it's called Voice of the Planet. It's a 10 part miniseries um, all around global ecology. And it aired in 1991 through 1993. It's called Voice of the Planet. And in this series of shows, um, we traveled from, oh, you name it, boy, we went from Nepal, we went to the base of Mount Everest, we went to, um, one of my speakers is a Mount Everest climber. I, I know all his routes. We were at the monastery called Tangbushe. Um, we went from Tangbushe back to um, all over Europe. Uh, we shot in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we shot in the outback uh, at Ayers Rock. Boy, we went all over the world. We shot in the Amazon. We went down to Manaus. <laughs> wow. We shot on the Amazon River and in the forest. Um, we shot on Indi Indian reservations in... Um, the Hopi, uh, Hopi Nation down there right. in Arizona. Um, it was about, on that particular uh, production, we were on about 12 countries. Shatner was with us for about half the time. And then he went back and we went and covered some other footage. Um, the whole point of the show was um, Shatner was a, a professor in global ecology and he was taking a one-year sabbatical to basically do this autobiography on planet Earth, such as the deforestation going on in Mount Everest, um, the pollution in um, Sao Paulo in Brazil, where we were um, covering the pollution. Um, oh, it's just a long story. But uh, that was Voice of, the, Voice of the Planet. And once I got back to Colorado after that long excursion, I was a different person. You know, I had I'd been like in video boot camp, and, and um, that was a, a big acceleration to my career, right. which led me to other documentary work um the whitewater rafting show in turkey um i did another um the author the, the authors of um the negotiation book getting to yes um yuri and fisher i forgot roger yuri and bill fisher uh, we did a bunch of um work with them in israel and in um down there in uh, cyprus so that was another piece of documentary work we did. Um, anyway, I kind of went through that whole realm for a while. I did some outdoor adventure shows, some climbing shows. Um, while at the same time, I was getting invested in the speaker world. And so that led me to all the work I've done with speakers. Um, every now and then I'd pick up a documentary assignment and I'd go off to some country. I went with uh, Scott Friedman to, um, to Thailand to do the show um uh i can change the world um 
Um, so we went to all those uh, orphanages all over, right. basically Southeast Asia, and uh, covered that. Made a thirty-minute episode out of that. I can change the world. Together, we can change the world. Um, and that led me to today, which is post-COVID, which we're but, all dealing with. Yeah, but I do want to hear today, but there's so many. I have too many questions. How in the world did you get noticed? Because there's a there were a lot of shooters before you went on that big excursion with Shatner, right? And somehow yeah. Mark Camacho in Denver gets <laughs> picked out. How do you get picked? Yeah, that's a crazy thing. So I was still connected to the PBS station uh, in Denver. I was on my own doing my own business, and I was still connected, and so I knew people. And uh, uh, the PBS station there took on the project um, in cooperation with um, the Maryland Public TV station. Um, and um, there was a fellow out of California who was the uh, actual producer of the show. And through Maryland came to KRMA TV and KRMA TV was looking for people. And since I was independent and I wasn't, you know, stuck to a, a salaried schedule, I was an independent freelance ah. producer. Um, and plus people liked me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause in the TV business, if they don't like you, if you're not liked, they don't want you to be on the staff, on the crew, right. you know, TV production, like most life things, it's all about getting along and working towards a common goal. And I've always been easy to get along with, and I've always been inspired and looking to what works and what, instead of what doesn't. Right. And just my personality sort of blended with this request. And, um, you know, one person knows another person, that person said, hey, have Camacho do it. He, at the time, I was known for my engineering capabilities. So I had a particular task, which was I could shoot and I could edit. But I had this engineering background. And so I became the engineer in the field uh, the, that they call EIC, engineer in charge. So my role was just to keep the production going. And there were a few people that had my skills that were fun to work with. I mean, technical people were, back then were engineer types, were, right. had no personality. Ah. So I just happened to kind of fall into it because I, I, I could jive with the crew. And plus I, I had engineering background. And so I kept the production going when mics, you know, crapped out or when right. the power right. skitched out and I needed to get, you know, generator power or whatever I had to do. I was the guy to make the production in the field happen. Well, it's funny cause um, I've told you this in the past, but you're, you're kind of echoing it. I, I've thought that your marketing plan, your business plan regarding getting speakers to work with you is just be a nice guy. <laughs> Like it's like this most simple plan ever, and it works really well because you're a really nice guy. And then, of course, your end product is awesome. But I, I think the business plan is just be nice. You know, you have to just. It has to matter, and what matters to me is first what matters to you, right? That's that's how it works with me, and you're the same way. What matters to you is what matters to them before it matters to you. And, you know, you live life that way and you live life with helping others get what they want, right? That whole, that old saying, get the, help them get what they want and get, you'll get what you want. I don't do that purposely, but that's just kind of inherent in who I am. Right. I'm more interested in the other person succeeding. I'll get what I get along the way. And it's usually pretty good. And also the intentionality, right? You know, you have, I mean, the other day I was talking to Carolyn Strauss. She says, we're all energy beings. Right. And I, I believe that. And so what's in your mind and what's in your intention plays out into how you're received, received by and perceived by other person. And and it's not fake. Yeah. You live life like that and your energy kind of paves the way. I don't know why that makes me giggle, but it's kind of woo-woo a little bit more woo-woo than I would have expected from Mark Camacho. Saying yeah, like, no, I, my energy I, I, is in alignment. My energy is set forth in the progression that I come to you in a way that I am perceived and seen by you. Oh, what was that all about? <laughs> I'm pretty sure well, my head just melted. Uh, that spun me around. <laughs> well, 
All right. All right. So what, what are you working on now? Because I'm so curious when you and I last worked together, video was just coming on the web, but so many things have changed so rapidly on the website of media, but I don't know how that works with you. Cause you're kind of, you're a new school guy, but you have this experience in the old school. So what are you doing? Okay, well, so pre-COVID, of course, everybody's producing, you know, media, produ uh, producing their demo video and um, getting it on their website and populating their website with all this footage. Post-COVID, well, not even post-COVID, during COVID, of course, everybody had to have a home studio. So I got real popular all of a sudden, people asking me, how do I build a home studio? So in fact, I'm actually on Ecamm like you are. Um, in fact, I'll show you. So I created Livestream Denver, right? So Livestream Denver helps those people who didn't want to create a home studio come to our studio and deliver their program virtually in a beautiful set, right? So that's why you create a live stream. Well, during that same time, let me advance forward here. We, we, I created that with Mark. Here's a video I'm, gonna, I'm not going to play. So this is the kit I created for those who needed to create a home studio. Ah. Well, that was all fine and dandy. A lot of, and a lot of people said, okay, and I, I sold the kit to, you know, a number of people and I helped the other people, you know, piecemeal a studio together. Right. And that's all fine. And that's during COVID. And now, you know, we're kind of still in COVID. Um, and, but we're now doing live events. And so now the issue is, I'm going to go forward here. I don't have these in uh, the order I'd like. I'm going to, so here's the studio itself, the live stream studio. But now there's your home studio, right? Oh. So now what's happening is people are coming back and saying, you know, I've got capabilities in my home studio, like you, Brad, you have pretty nice capabilities. But the difficulty is now you're, now you're taxed having to present with one part of your brain, right? You have to change your slides, right. do your content, do your story. While at the same time, the other side of your brain is having to push buttons, press, press buttons, cut to a close up, cut to the over the shoulder, cut to the slide, maybe yourself with the slide with yourself in the corner of the slide, right? Well, the left side of your brain is trying to figure all the, you know, scenes to show while the right side of your brain, well, I'm backwards, is trying to do the content and change your slides. Right. It's almost impossible, right? It's just almost impossible. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know that. Yeah. The, I'm laughing so, because I'm living through the pain you're describing, right? So I'm one of the speakers who said, okay, I can go shopping on Amazon. I can watch YouTube videos on how to do this stuff, but you're right. There's a huge chasm between owning that stuff and being able to run it and not get distracted. And the reason I have Eric Chester on this, because he went through this, he's going through the same thing. He has a really nice setup. I helped him put it all together and he's got the lights and the background and the monitor and all that, but he still has to push the buttons and deliver at the same time. Yeah. So, so, now what's going on is um, I'm doing what we call remote production. So um, I'm doing this a lot with Jim Davidson, the climber. So with Jim, I literally, I'll go back to my, so with Jim, I literally log onto his computer um, with a thing called Screen Connect. I'm live on, in my studio touching his computer, right? I'm remotely accessing his computer and I actually sit, at my place and when his show starts i'm his behind the scenes producer so <laughs> no I the, yeah it's it, it works really well so i'm behind the scenes as jim is standing there he's got he's actually in a set like this he's actually standing not sitting but he's delivering a show right and as he's delivering and he goes to uh do a video i cut to the slide and there's the video and the video is playing and he comes back i might cut back to a close-up Right. And he's telling me the story, telling me the story. Oh, and I might then cut back to the wide shot. I might, I might cut back to the slide 
or I might cut back to him in the corner of the slide. Anyway, it's a live production, remote production. And so Jim can just focus on delivery and his clicker. And he just stands there and delivers and I do all the switching. And it's a basically a $350 fee. And he passes it on to his client as, you know, technical services. And he doesn't I, have to do all that stuff. I love this for so many reasons. Like for so many reasons. One, it's creative. Two, we didn't even know any of those things you were talking about two years ago. Or like most of us, muggles didn't. You guys did. But and knowing that you can do this remote, so you're you're in your place, he's in his place, and you're running his you're producing. I'm producing his show using remote connection and I'm accessing his computer and I'm pushing the buttons on his computer so he can just focus on delivery and changing his slides. And we've done it about probably nine times now. We have three more coming up in the next three weeks. Um, it's a great service. I haven't really promoted it. Um, it's just hard to um, educate the person. You know, I have to kind of do what we're doing here. I have to kind of show it. Right. But once a person um, understands it, um, what I do is I have a, um, a one-time fee technical setup where we'll connect to their computer, I'll show them how it works, and then we're done. And then so when their event happens, they're already acclimated to the whole situation. And then um, their event happens. I'm actually an attendee in their event. I just, I put up a slide. Actually, I put up this slide. Um, my um, Anyway, I put up a slide, and so nobody sees me. They just and don't hear me, and I'm in the background, and Jim right. says, by the way, my uh, remote producer is joining us, so that's where you're seeing that logo. And I watch him de deliver, and I right. switch his scenes. <laughs> and it's really great. And um, he's had actually great feedback, to people telling him, how do you do that? You know, how are you doing the performance and the scene changes at the same time? They, they don't get it. And I can quickly cut back and forth pretty readily because it's right. just a click of a button and he doesn't have to think about it. Um, so we're kind of a team that way. If that makes sense. Yeah. I've, that silence is just me thinking it's really cool. All right. So, but uh, answer me this or riddle me this. Um, you've done so many different things. Your, your superpowers and your skills are intense. Are you digging this? Is that a fun job? Yeah, well, this part is fun. This remote producing, I like a lot because I can do it remotely. I can do it virtually. And, um, you know, I coach them into the studio setup. So these are people like I helped Jim buy his studio equipment last year. And then there he was like, okay, I have all this stuff now. Like, uh, it's kind of hard to do both <laughs> things at the same time. And so I show up with this, you know, solution. And that's that part's fun. So you know, all I have to do is educate the speaker, right. get them set up the first time, and then they're sold. Um, in fact, NSA, I was going to do the demonstration for their meeting on November, but they weren't ready. So I'll do that in um, the January meeting for NSA Colorado. I'm going to do this kind of same demonstration oh, so they can see, oh, that's not hard, you know. And you don't have to have eCam. Like, um, I'm using eCam right now. You have eCam. I could literally log into your computer, you can do a presentation, and I can do all the switching, and you'll look like a rock star. But you don't have to have eCam. Um, Blackmagic is another switcher. You guys are familiar with Blackmagic. Yep. I can, you, they can have Blackmagic. Um, there's also Prezi Video, it's, um, another software people have. Yep. It works on there. So I kind of educate them on what platform works best based on how technical or, or not technical they would want to be. One of the themes, uh, one of the themes I'm seeing with you is you're you're very willing to go through change. You're willing to say like, oh, for whatever reason, COVID, uh, technology, whatever, uh, I'm going to change my business up a little bit. And you're good at that. That doesn't seem to intimidate you. No, well, only because um, I'm going to have to be honest here. This was Jim's idea. <laughs> <laughs> I helped Jim build a studio, right? Right. He bought part of my kit, and then he was frustrated. Um, so was Eric, actually. And um, he said, can't you just connect to my computer remotely and help me do this? 
I said, yeah, you know, I can. And so we kind of designed it that way. And right. so before you know it, so to answer your question, I just sort of follow along. And if something feels like it's a necessity, then I'll provide it. I, I don't come up with these. Or sometimes I do, but I just see an opportunity and I think, you know what? People would benefit from that. Right. And, and you know, I enjoy helping people get where they need to get. And I'm thinking, this is a really nice service that I could benefit from. They could benefit from. It wouldn't cost a lot, you know. And um, so at, at some point, I'll probably give it up to a, a lot more speakers, you know, once I educate. Um, actually, through um, eSpeakers, you, you're familiar with eSpeakers, sure. of course. Um, they're interested in doing this. Me and Mark Sanborn created um, a program with eSpeakers called VPI, Virtual um, Presenters Institute. And VPI created this um, series of uh, six online video courses. Um, well, there's six topics in this online course. And it basically teaches you how to um, build your home studio and then how to present in an environment that looks good and all that. Um, so eSpeakers now wants to start promoting this virtual producer, you know, to the hundreds and, and on and on. And so they want to have a staff of people like myself that, you know, come in and um, log in and um, provide this service for speakers who are constantly doing right. virtual presentations. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, it's actually not that complex. It feels complex, but it's really not. It just takes a minute to connect to the yeah, computer. I get it. When, yeah. Well, it's a, uh, again, I love it for a dozen reasons. Partly, I just love you. I just think it's so interesting to me that every time I'm talking to you, you're like, oh, yeah, because this changed, I figured I could do that. And then that went really well for me. And since I'm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and since people like me, it, it's going exceptionally well. Uh, you know, I hate to say it that way. I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm yeah, saying it for you. Other, we help each other get along in this world, right? We, that's, we help each other like, you know, we're all in the same world barrel. We're sometimes one person's pushing the world barrel and sometimes somebody else is pushing the world barrel. But we're all in the world barrel going forward and well, sometimes let, we take turns. Let's, let me take you on to a different topic. Um, when so when you first started that business, you bought a ten thousand dollar camera that was not a normal camera. But things have changed in that uh, muggles can afford pretty good cameras, and muggles can afford editing gear that did not exist for home users. And muggles can buy lights on Amazon or whatever. How has that changed things for you? Because it seems to me there's a lot of people like me who sort of understand, but don't really, right? So yeah. what's your take as a pro on having this army of people coming in saying, oh, I live stream, I do this, I do that. But we, you know, our skills are really limited. You know, everybody has a threshold, right? A pain threshold. So you'll get to a point and then you'll hit that pain threshold where it's no longer any fun to go forward. You know, some people can go really beyond a certain point. Technically, I'm speaking. So everybody has a technical th pain threshold. And so they kind of find me when they've reached that threshold. And I just sort of gather up, you know, I've kind of <laughs> taken inventory of where they're at with cameras and lights and mics. And I just move them past that pain, pain right. threshold. I've never thought of it that way. I just came up with that. I'm just It was saying, pretty good. That If that was on the fly, good job. <laughs> but it just I just moved them past that point. And then I just help them, you know, and I help them understand that this is how this works. And you've already got these pieces in place. All we're going to do is do it this way. And you're going to do that. And you're going to get past that point. And then, and then after that, it's pretty easy. Right. Well, you've never yeah. felt, uh, at least I, I'm, I'm, I'm in my imagination, I don't think you've ever felt threatened by the fact that people can go buy Final Cut Pro and, uh, and a decent, you know, a thousand dollar camera and look pretty good. You, good. You, you just know, you just know that you've, you've got other stuff. I, I encourage people. I always encourage people, you know, I encourage people to go as far as they can. And, you know, and they'll ask me, well, and they think they're taking my time or they feel bad. Like, you know, they're asking me, 
technical questions or some assistance and they feel like i'm not going to pay you you know they feel funny like, <laughs> they don't want to really ask you because they're not asking you for they just want to know so they can get past that little point of pain i can see that right away and i, I just let them realize it's fine just do it this way try this try that you know i i want people to to experiment and go as far as they can go i'm not threatened by that at all because there's you know there's a lot out there for all of us there's there's no limited supply of service or money or you know we all live in a world of of an infinite possibility so i'm not threatened that i won't have any right. more clients somebody always needs me to do something and if they don't, then my usefulness has, has ended and that's yeah. okay too. Yeah. You know, we just, we do as much as we can while we can. And, and at some point our usefulness is kind of past, but somehow, you know, I'm still useful. <laughs> oh, you are useful, <laughs> Mr. Camacho. Well, um, I, I, but I think this, we're not really just talking about video and media because no. It's kind of a life uh, approach, right? Because like you can get some people get nervous, like oh, you're you think you can do what I do or whatever, or feel threatened. And that's just not the way you roll. I, I know this from personal experience because I got really interested in video editing, which was actually um, helpful because it just made me realize how freaking hard it is. Like you know, I'm once I got past a certain level, I realized I'm never going to be good at this. Like I'm, I, I could be okay. I'm just never going to be very good, ever, and and th that kind of gave me a lot of respect for people like you. But also, it meant I remember talking to you like Mark. I'm trying to do some of my own video stuff, and you were like, "It's okay, Brad. I still love you." <laughs> <laughs> I want you to do what you can do. I mean, no, there's there's no limited amount. I mean, there's no finite amount of opportunity. It, it's always out there, and we do. You know, we help each other. That's we're not here to make money. We're here to help each other get ahead in life. And no, I'm definitely here to make money. <laughs> you have an agenda. Your agenda is to make people feel good and give them inspiration and motivation and, and make them laugh and make them happy that they are sitting in the seat, you know, in your audience. You're all about that. Yeah, and, but you know, yeah. And not only that, I know you as, as a matter of fact, and you know, you have this skill. And not everybody has this skill. This is why, you know, you have the, the, the success you've had is you're able to get on stage and just basically go raw. You're able to just be unfiltered and unattached and untethered to what you feel about yourself or your ego or who thinks that you might not be funny. You know, you're untethered and you just, you live out loud and you're uh -huh. on stage and you're present and you're real and your boyish cuteness, all that you are, you just, you are that. You are not something conjured up. You're not worried about what, you're just present and you're real and you're untethered by emotional thoughts of, you know, acceptance or rejection uh -huh. or denial, all that stuff. Well, what I'm you hearing know, from you, besides a very kind, compliment and i'm thank you for that is also that i'm hiding my manias and insecurities from you really well <laughs> uh, uh, they are totally i think we all have those but I, but I do accept your compliment that's very kind of you well then if you have those you have the skill of checking them at the door right you've heard that term check it at the door and you get up there and and you know you're just people just are engaged because you've checked it at the door and that's what it's all about in your business is being real and being authentic. Well, this podcast is sweet because now I don't need therapy. Thanks to you. Boom. <laughs> Mark Camacho, media director, producer, rock star, and therapist. Uh, let's talk about how video has changed because this is one of the things I really wanted to bring up with you. I notice when I watch even a 10 year old movie on Netflix, Oh, this, even though I'm not able to articulate it always, it just feels old. And I'm wondering in the genre you work in, uh, speakers, demos, and documentary style stuff, 
that that has to have changed a ton too. And can you kind of catch us up on how you see the world with video? Because I, like I said, I don't even have the vocabulary to do it. Well, you know, it all started with um, reality TV. And so, you know, short format reality TV and it's quick and it's real and it's fast. And, and even today versus 10 years ago, reality TV, today's reality TV, you know, the editors are, are young and they're quick and snappy. And so these shots are two second shots. You know, my shots typically are no shorter than maybe a five, six second shot, you know, cut away or this or that, or if I'm doing a corporate thing and I'm producing a promotional video, my shots are, you know, never less than three seconds. Um, you know, you see, you watch like, let's say on Bravo, um, I don't know, like that uh, below deck show. Yeah. That quick. And not only is it quick, but there's multiple cameras. You know, we don't just in the old days, we had one camera person shooting different scenes, wide shot, close up, different things. Now there's multiple cameras and there's, you know, GoPros and other lockdown cameras. And then there's always two operators. One has a kind of a wide scene, one has a close up. And the editor is just jamming through these shots, right. just bang, 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 bang. And, and it's because, you know, the new generation of viewers are so used to having information come at them from all sorts of media outlets that their attention um, is short. And so quick shots, quick information, right. quick sound bite, bing, bing, bing. And that, that's what they need to do to keep people involved. That's interesting to me that it seems kind of obvious once you said it, but you're, you're able to measure the number of seconds per clip and compare them. You said they're at two seconds and you're like, never, never less than three for me. It's such a concrete way to describe that. Well, because there's 30 frames in a video second. And so when we're editing, I know just by looking at my timeline, you know, it says, you know, two seconds, 15 frames. I'm, I edit down to the frame and so does any editor. So they always know, am I at, you know, three, 10, three minutes, 10 frames. I mean, three seconds, 10 frames, or am I at five seconds and 14 frames? You just know by looking as you're editing. And I just know for me, it's comfortable to be in the three second to three second and 10 frames. So three and a half or three and a half second type shot. And so when you're watching these shows, you can tell just because if you've been an editor for many, many years, you, you can look at a shot and you can say that was 42 frames. You can almost get no way. down. Yeah. You can look at a shot, bing, 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 and you can say those are 20 frame shot, uh, edits, which is uh, um, two thirds of a second. Well, so help me with this. It, it, that's a, is that a style or is that a trend, those rapid fire shots? I would say it's a trend. It's only because, you know, we have so much coming at us at the, and we're, we're right. constantly you know, interrupted. So I think it'll, it'll probably change. I'm sure it'll, they can't go any faster. But if that's the so, trend, why are you sticking at three and a half seconds? If if the trend's two, I'm missing something here, but I don't know what it is. It, so then you're in, yeah, if that answer, then that would be style. Because my style, I I don't really create things that fast. So like I'm creating a thing for a pizza company right now. Um, it's a five minute promotional video. And it's a, a, it's a wood fired pizza oven that they sell to concessionaires. And that person hooks it up to their truck and they drive it to a food festival, you know, and it's the back of the truck and it's this beautiful wood fired pizza oven. Cool. And then they sell pizzas for 10 bucks. So I'm making a video for this company to uh, promote to all these um, resorts and golf courses so that they can buy a, a, ah. a tr an oven, pull it up and put it at the golf course on the, on the ninth tee or something. Um, so in that case, I would have the, I could make it really quick and rapid fire, but in that case, it's more of a style thing. My style is, more pleasant and you know gentle music mm. you know and i mean i have some motivational inspiring little sound bites and little music stingers but i tend to be more like kind of gentle so you know you want to buy this because it makes you feel good and you have good beautiful imagery of people eating pizza maybe in slow motion and maybe some little sound effect of crackling fire in the background and you can kind of feel the sensation of that pizza being cooked in the pizza oven, you know, 
So in that case, that's my style. Right. So maybe, you know, maybe people's style, maybe they'll be, maybe their style will change, but you know, that just happened, happens to be how I create. Can, just, uh, kinda, yeah. can you recognize that? So when, like in your, um, in your world, do you see video and go like, that's Camacho? Cause you recognize it. Um, or, I mean, that's, not, no. it doesn't work cause yeah, it's yourself, yeah. but you know what I mean? Yeah, so if I saw something, I'm like, you know, that's something that I would create like in that fashion. Yes. Like if I watch like a corporate thing or if I watch something, maybe it's a promotion for the city of Carlsbad, right? I'm in Carlsbad right now. And I was looking recently for what are they doing to promote Carlsbad? You know, like they do with Colorado, you know, come to Colorado and ski the, the, the bowls and all that. And um, I saw a piece on Carlsbad and I thought that's something that, you know, is my kind of style. It was you know, really elegant shooting, um, fluid, um, some slow motion, people playing in the water with, you know, little droplets, slow motion, close up droplets of water, you know? So yeah, I can see my style here and there. Right. Yeah. All right. So if you and I sit down and watch Netflix together, are you any fun? Or <laughs> meaning like when you watch a commercial or a Hollywood or whatever, are you just constantly thinking about that edit oh that was slow motion and the, did you hear this fire sound effect like the pizza or are you actually having fun watching tv no i, I don't i don't uh, critique it um if the only thing i might critique is the storyline i might critique like you know that director could have cut that whole uh, scene or that, that you know that story was not credible I, I probably critique the director style, like, you know, this should be cut, that should be cut. But I don't say, I don't, I don't comment during, I just, I am in my own mind, I might think. But it's that's what I'm thinking. You, I don't know if you could turn that off. Like that, because no. you have that analytical mind that's looking at it going, I see this, I, I understand it. Yeah, I, I probably do that all the time without realizing how much I do it. But if I was sitting with you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to say, hey, Camacho. Like, shut, shut up, up mark yeah. you wouldn't have to say that i would just be maybe thinking oh, they're voting know. someone off the island be quiet i don't care about the camera <laughs> angle yeah yeah i, I wouldn't but i wouldn't be a pain on I your feel, couch. <laughs> i'm a um very 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 amateur artist meaning i've taken some drawing classes and i i, th I kind of think that's helpful in the human experience because it forces you to look at things in a different way when you're trying to draw them and for me, learning how to edit video, even at a very basic level, has been so f fascinating just because we see video everywhere and it gives me such a, an appreciation because, you know, there's a lot to it. And once you start, once you learn a little bit, you realize, oh, I had no idea there were these layers. Yeah, it's, it's time consuming. You'll spend an hour doing, you know, 25 seconds. You know, you'll spend time. It's time consuming and it's like i've always considered it like um like a puzzle because in your head you know what you have you have a bunch of different shots and you have a message you want to convey and you have sound bites from different people and so you have all these pieces in your head and you think okay what's the best what goes first what goes uh, next right. what goes in between and you just sort of have all these pieces floating around in your head and you play it out in your head, like if I did it this way, this way, this way, this way, that would create that outcome. Or if I did it this way, this way, this way, that might tease right. the outcome. So it's just a puzzle that, and I, I kind of like puzzles. Yeah. How has technology changed for you? I remember editing with you in your office and, um, you know, it was so fun because I get to sit over your shoulder and then you're like, all right, Brad, we're going to have to render this. So let's go have coffee. Like, you know, cause that would take forever. And then it was, uh, yeah, Brad, I had to boot you off the hard drive. Cause you know, yeah. I, I, we got to get rid of this. Yeah. And I'm guessing that's not the same anymore. Well, the hard drive storage is still an issue. You know, um, what's changed is, you know, you can compress video to smaller file sizes, but you have to be careful. Cause if you go down too small, and then you want to re re expand it. You can't, you know, right. it's compressed, it's compressed. And if you lose the original, 
And you might want, you know, let's say you lost your, or let's say you deleted the original because you've already got these compressed versions then you can't go back. Whoops. So uh, I keep all the original files and um, I tend to, well, I actually don't re -erase, erase a whole lot of stuff, but if I do erase, I'll keep the edited original high resolution and I'll erase the source files because, you know, you might have a hundred gigs of source file and one gig of the master file that's been edited and done. And, um, you know, if I have to, I'll delete the source files. But sometimes if you delete the source files, you can't really go back and change the master because the master is layered, you know, one image over another image. Right, right. Sound, and so you can't deconstruct it. But if you have the source files, you can deconstruct it. So the answer to your question is we just buy more hard drive storage, which has come down. Um, right. Like we buy these four terabyte, well, these kind of things. These are, um, where, the, where is the camera? There it is. You know, these are these um, four terabyte and six terabyte SATA drives, and they plug in, you know, to your drive configuration, and they're only like eighty dollars, and four terabytes will hold, you know, it'll hold ten, twenty hours of high res video, or more. So I tend to just keep buying those, and I put them aside as I as they fill up. And then I, I have a kind of a, a way of categorizing. Right. Well, cause that, like, I would think your clients would buy into that immediately. Like I need to charge you 80 bucks or we have to delete your files. No, yeah. Charge me I, 80 bucks. I, yeah. I, you know, another thing that I do is, um, I like to make it easy for people. Like I still have your stuff, Brad. Like if I, I probably, so I'm on right now, I'm on hard drive 26. <laughs> so I have one to 26. So I have 26 of these guys. And um, if you said, you know, what do you have of mine? I would go and pull up and I would have some of your stuff on, let's say, drive 13 or drive 12 or something. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really erase speaker stuff. I erase, um, you know, like corporate stuff that I've shot. Like, you know, years from now, I'll erase that pizza stuff, but I'll keep the edited master on file. But for some reason, I've just taken a personal interest in all my speaker friends. And so I have stuff from Eric Chester from 1985. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, I, so what we've talked about the past. We've talked about what's happening right now. What, what, are, what's, what's coming? Like, what are, what are you looking forward to? What's, what do we need to be ready for? In, in the media world or in yeah. general? Media, media, media and world. video and uh, yeah, uh, all things. I don't even know the right words, but I, I think you've kind of nailed it with, because you don't call yourself a video guy. You call yourself a media guy. Yeah. So media. media. Yeah. What's the future of media? Um, that's a really good question. So I would say um, miniaturized for, so if we're going to speak physically, everything's miniaturized, of course, smaller cameras, um, lighter weight equipment um the of course, of course solid state hard drives now have replaced all the other drives so more storage on lighter and um higher capacity drives um cameras uh, i mean cell phone cameras now are acceptable for methods of broadcast gopros are acceptable methods of broadcast so cheaper technology smaller technology 4K is now kind of pretty standard. So 8K is coming next. And, um, you know, 8K is eight times HD resolution. Jeez. And so um, because of that, you can, when you edit 8K or 4K, you can um, pick a scene and you can zoom into that scene, kind of like in the method where you take a really high pixeled image and you zoom into a portion of it and it still right. looks pretty sharp. Same thing. And so in video, you know, multiple, uh, well, you have multiple ways of getting Im an image, whether you have m multiple cameras or you have one camera at 8K and you zoom into a portion of the screen. So that's like already around the corner. Um, um, I hadn't thought about I, that because I, yeah. I was wondering about the 4K because like my TV is not 4K. I don't I'm I'm pretty sure if I looked at 4K, I wouldn't recognize it. But I hadn't thought about the fact that you can zoom in and use a piece of that without losing, right. without anyone that's noticing. 
yeah, it's like a, you know, 50 megabit, megabit image. Right. You know, so if you printed that image, you could print it a large or you could right. zoom into a small portion of it. Same thing with video. So I yeah, hadn't I'm, thought of that. Yeah. Well, how about the way, like, do you see trends on how we're going to use video? Because I remember when we started hearing, oh, video is going to be on the internet. It's going to be big. Well, that's proven to be true. Do we have any changes coming up that we need to see? Or are we just kind of more of the same? I'd say more of the same. Obviously, you know, the more video you have on your site, the better your search results happen. You know, search engines look for video content ahead of just regular content. Um, yeah, I'd say um, more of the same, just higher quality, you know, higher resolution. Um, yeah, of course there's, you know, surround sound, um, but that's not really that important and, you know, regular content delivery, but um, definitely the picture resolution and also the ability to um, not buffer, you know, so compression technologies yeah. have gotten better and better with like MP4 is kind of the latest standard. And um, that, you know, that gives you really nice picture quality without buffering and holding, um, you know, you know what buffering is. Yeah, it's funny because um, we haven't seen it for a while, right? But it, it seems like yesterday where it would say buffering. Yeah. Yeah, that's getting stronger and stronger with compression technology. Yeah. Well, it's, well, you're a good man. I still, <laughs> I still, I still am tickled by um, your business model, really, because I, I see you sponsoring organizations and getting your name out there. But mostly, I think you're just people talk about you and say things like this: "Oh, Mark Camacho took care of me, and he was so great, and he was fun to work with, and he actually seemed to care about trying to get my project right." Yeah. He's a nice yeah. guy. He's a nice guy. Yeah, I get that. Mr. Nice Guy. But that's, yeah. I think it's a legit business model. All right. We are there. I want to ask a couple questions that I ask everybody. So yeah. these are not about media. Um, I'm super interested with my work on stage about mentoring and role modeling and, you know, being an encourager and having an encourager. I wonder who those people are for you. Do you when, if I say, Mark, who encouraged you along this long adult adulthood you've had? Does someone come to mind? Do people come to mind? Uh, I have two answers. One, um, I'm going to go back to that coach in high school. So I, he's still my really good friend. Um, in fact, he named me his executor to his uh, estate. Wow. Um, I know his children. He, he's got four children. And so I'm going to be the executor to um, put, you know, put his, um, settle his assets. Um, but he's my high school football and wrestling coach. And um, he wrote a book recently about his, you know, experience in high school athletics and mentoring young kids. And so he asked me to write a, um, a little blip on the back, like a testimonial. Yeah. And I wrote that he introduced me to my potential. Mm. He introduced me to my potential because so, you know, as a young person, you don't realize your capability until someone kind of points it out. You know, as you get older, you start to understand yourself more and what drives you. And then you kind of follow your own path. But as a young person, he introduced me to my own potential. I didn't realize I had these abilities and I didn't, nobody in my family was entrepreneurial they would they went to work and and were hard workers um so he, he was my primary mentor my coach and he you know he didn't let me quit at one time um, we all also did track and he was a, on the track team as a coach and it was my freshman year and i ran the low hurdles and i i just wasn't very good at it you know and i ran this one meet and I was just sucking at it and I was doing my best. <laughs> and I, I kicked the hurdle and knocked it down and kept running and hit. And finally the last hurdle, I tripped over the last hurdle. And by then I'm in the <laughs> last place and everybody's already past the finish line. And I, I tripped off the last hurdle and I got up <clears throat> and I like basically 
jogged into the finish line. Like I just was so di disappointed. Right. And, and he got really mad at me. And he said, you never, he grabbed me by the shirt right off the finish line. You never, never quit. I don't care if you're in last place. And I was all, you know, disappointed. I don't care how you feel. You finish with pride. And that really stuck with me. And, and I realized that I, you know, just sort of sauntered in because I was all, I figured, well, I already lost. I'm right. Run in. Yeah. And I never, ever, ever did that again in, you know, in theory. I never stopped short. I always finished at 100% just because of that one moment. Right. And then, and then with the speaker world, that was my second answer to your question is, you know, that's why I love the speaker world because I remember um, a long time ago, um, NSA gave me an award for vendor of the year and I had, I couldn't be there. I had to do this Europe trip and um, I'm not sure who it was. It might've been Bob Wendover. Somebody, I said, well, I'll accept the award for you. Um, what should I say or whatever? I said, you know, just tell everybody that they inspire me to be a better me. And so really I have the coach. And I have all my speaker pals watching all you guys up there just living out loud and being fear fearless you guys all inspire me to be a better me and and so th that's really mm. oh crap Aww. i'm like that's so touching i know, I know it, it's totally exactly I, the answer to your question i remember you telling me that years ago that one of the things you liked about your job is you were watching speakers and hopefully enough of them were good that you felt like oh, i'm getting something out of these people well you know it rubs off i mean i've done this for i don't know 30 some years and you know there's a certain energy back to energy that everybody in the speaker community has which is that positive forward thinking you know inspired way of living their life and and being fearless and stepping forward and and proclaiming some content, whatever their message is, they proclaim it. You know, you're not afraid to stand up and say, this is what I represent. This is who I am. And this is what I believe. And I'm going to teach all of you what I believe is true. And I just find that really inspiring that people can get up and, and proclaim without any kind of, you know, strange thoughts in their head. They just stand up and they live with authenticity out loud. I like mm -hmm. that. I've always liked that. Yeah. That's Is it weird for me, you when you're, because you're so experienced at watching speakers. Is it? Turn that off. Uh, it's, it's me calling you. I'm calling you on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, is that the president calling you? Mark, we've got a video need. Get your camera. It's 10,000 bucks. Bring that crappy car here. Um, is it weird for you as you age and you you know more about what appeals to you and what doesn't appeal to you and you know about what works and what doesn't work when you're working with speakers and it, it, it maybe it's just not working and you know it? Is that hard? So you mean like if someone's doing some material and I think I don't believe that that's yeah or just maybe it's no. a, not that they exist but just pretend there's a crappy speaker out there. Yeah, okay, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot, lot of crappy speakers out there. No, that that's come up where, you know, do I feel like I want to, you know, represent this content that's really not authentic or it's not coming from a place, a place of, yeah, of true growth, but it's coming from a pa place of pain, right? Because mm. I've had speakers that are coming from pain and they proclaim all this knowledge, but it's coming from pain, not from growth. Uh. I, I've had that. How do you handle it? Um, you know, when you said me, the therapist, you know, that actually comes into play because I'll edit with this person for a while. And, um, you know, I'll gently suggest that, you know, maybe this is not the message you're pr trying to say. Maybe you're trying to say this. Maybe we shouldn't use this piece of video. Maybe you should record something new to say this. You know, think about what you're saying. Maybe that's not really what you're trying to say maybe that's what you're trying to get past you know and so 
will I'll go that'll happen. That's happened. Yeah. I've had people where they feel so uncomfortable with what they're saying that they'll refer to themselves in the third person. They'll say, Okay, let's edit when he walks across and does that. Oh, what does that mean? Well, it just means that they don't want to connect with the person that's on stage because they don't feel like they're yeah. in my opinion, they don't I don't think they're being congruent, you know. The person on stage is not the person in the chair editing. Right. And and I've I've had that once and it's been rare, but I've had people do that where okay, let's let's cut when he says this. Right. You know. And <laughs> you know, I, I mean <laughs> That's so fascinating to me. <laughs> well, but Mark, have you perfect. ever? Yeah, have you ever had the experience where you editing yourself? You know, I haven't really done a lot of that. Gosh, that's a good question. I haven't really had to, because um, every speaker I'm sure has told you we all hate looking at ourselves because all we see is the things that we do wrong. I'm wondering if you've had to go through that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, so I've been recorded and um, have I, okay, so the answer is I haven't edited that material. So I've done the same thing. I just kind of like, oh, I, I guess I don't need it right away. So I'm not going to mess with it. So yeah, I have footage where I just haven't messed with it. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, makes even like, Mark Camacho is human. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do have footage. That Scott Friedman thing in, in Malaysia. I did a little piece after John Cradelli and and I I was so nervous because John Cradelli is this amazing speaker and I had a, about a 20 minute slot after John for the Malaysian meeting planner association and I don't know I forgot what I talked about but I don't think it went very well <laughs> <laughs> I I bet it went way like 50 times better than whatever you think uh, well, and that's the true with all you speakers because everybody says, "Oh, I don't think so." Yeah, and then I'm like, "Hey, that's not bad. That's pretty good." Yeah, we're all we're right. Crazy. Um, you've been so generous. We've been. I took took up way more of your time than I promised I would. We're at that place. I like to ask every guest the same question. So here we have Mark Camacho. You are the principal at Eighty One Media. Inter is what do you call Eighty One Media International? Yes. Um, which, and by the now, way, and now and now live stream Denver and live stream Denver. Um, you've been at this a long time. You're a rock star. You're a business owner. You're an entrepreneur. What gives you hope? Okay, so I was thinking about that when you asked me that. I told me that earlier. Uh, well, here's what I like. I think COVID was a good thing for all of us to wake up and realize what's really important and where to put our best energy and where to put our, our focus, because we were all forced to reevaluate our life and what's important, whether it's, you know, our family or whether it's the career we were doing and now we're not doing it, or it just forced everyone to take kind of a, 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 a new look at their life and examine what's really valuable. Moving forward, what do I want to take from there? And what do I want to bring forward? And now what do I want to do in a way that makes sense makes me happy makes other people happy i'm that was great i think it was great that all of us as humanity had to go through that and step over the line and re-analyze re-evaluate what we're going to bring forward from that side of the line to this side of the line and how we're going to live our lives better knowing that we survived you know mm. A lot of us didn't survive, mm. but the ones that did survive, we have a chance to live in a different way, I, I, which I kind of play, play around with speaker fun little things, and um, I call it um, permission to graduate. So we've given ourselves, I like to think we all give ourselves permission to graduate from living a life of have to to living a life of want to. And so I think COVID have helped a lot of people graduate from how they wanted to live versus how they kind of were forced to live. So what, what did, what did you personally um, choose as when you were forced to think about what's important and what did you want to take forward? What did that mean for you? For, for me, um, I shifted everything around and um, I actually sold my 
my office. I sold um, the house next to the office. And I, I bought a house in Carlsbad. And so what shifted for me was I wanted to live in a place that I could edit because I was editing remotely. So I thought, well, shit, I'll just edit in sunny California because it's nice by the beach and I'll do all my shooting in Denver and I'll just commute. Right. So I figured out oh, I'm going to live a life in the sun <laughs> and commute to Denver and do my shoots. But then I'll edit because I'm always editing in my office in Denver. I'm like, well, why don't I edit? in a nice sunny home in California. So I shifted that and that's been real fun. Yeah. Other than I, other than getting on United every like six weeks, but that's not so bad. You're one of the uh, millions of Americans who's embraced virtual work. Yeah. That's why that's my hope. But as you said, what's your hope for the future? People were not only forced to, but it, people gave themselves permission to reevaluate their lives. And I think that's really cool because, I mean, why not? Like you went to Mexico and did that whole thing in Mexico for a year. You know, you gave yourself permission to live a life that was outside of the norm because you graduated. You said, I'm going to graduate from being this person. I'm going to graduate to be this person. And I'm going to travel from Mexico and do my keynote work. I'm going to come back and live in Mexico with my family. You gave yourself permission to graduate to that kind of level of life. And I think that's what COVID did. Uh, it forced people to do that, which you did consciously, but it forced people to do kind of that. Yeah. I love that. I love that answer partly because it's optimistic. Yeah. Right, because yeah. COVID, some people, some people didn't make any life choices during COVID. They were busy surviving. They were busy trying to get through a new depression or whatever. But I, your take is more positive, and I like that. Yeah, it it forced people to to reckon. Yeah, to you know to reconsider, reanalyze. And you're right. Some people, it was really bad, and they lost a lot of money. But if they look at it differently, you know. They also lost a way of life that maybe wasn't successful. And now right. they're into another life that it'll be maybe not. It's successful, it's successful in a different way. But, you know, whatever we do, it's purposeful. It's just, yeah, sometimes we don't understand the purpose, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have purpose. It just means we don't always understand it. And that's where we should end it on Mark Camacho being a little bit, not too much, a little bit, woo -woo, just a little, a little this bit. much. I don't know where that came from. Reuse your question. Well, uh, what's your website? So we are at 81mediainternational.com, number 81, and also livestreamdenver.net. I, I, I think there's a hyphen. Is there a hyphen in livestream? Yes, yeah, so livestream hyphen Denver. Dot com, not dot net. Livestreamdenver-com. So that's with Mark Sanborn and I. And um, and then, like I said, we also partnered with eSpeakers to create VPI. Um, uh, I don't even know the full. I think it's just vpi.net, actually. And that teaches speakers how to um, create home studio and how to create content in their home studio. Nice. And so it's basically an online video course um, for produced by Mark Sanborn and I, myself with um, e-speakers who wrote the curriculum. Well, dude, thank you for saying yes to this. I'm, I'm glad to get to hang out with you. Yeah, glad to man. get to learn more. Everybody, hit him up. If you need anything to do with media, he's your guy. Mark, hang out with me. Everybody, uh, thanks for being you. Thanks for being here. Hit like and subscribe yeah, and all that social media stuff that helps me more than you might guess. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.